Okay. All right. Um, I just wanted to mention that we also have three other really special poets that will be reading after the Open Hands group reads, and um, I'm excited about that too. So um, I uh, wrote this, uh, it was the, probably the first poem I remember reading uh, or writing, and, um, and I wrote it kind of from the twilight of uh, sleep deprivation with a colicky baby and assisted after going, getting over the cesarean birth. And I haven't really touched it since then because it felt like I didn't want to mess with it. <laughs> and so I found it in my writing. Cesarean birth. My breathing joins with the seas, heart pounding on rocks, keeping time, keeping life's rhythm, then the knife. My body open, soft core removed, riding now on my belly, alone, exposed, afraid. Pitiful choked pain, mewling cry, small softness, my cantaloupe not ripe but ready to meet air, sweet breath of ice, alone, exposed, afraid. Soft sucking sounds, a lover's noisy breath, this child taking warmth, taking life's juice, greedily gulping, connected, protected, safe. My body joins again with the sea's heart, vessel of life, sucking, panting, gobbling, connected, protected, safe. Thank you. Um, I would say that I wrote this poem because I remember feeling, before I had children, I remember wanting them and feeling disconnected from my life. And this is what, this is what happened when I, this is what my children did for me. It's called The Substance of Hope. Back when liquor Back when hope came in liquor, cigarettes, chocolates, and sex, it would only last an hour, maybe a night. By the time I closed my eyes to grab it, it had slipped off my shoulder like a silk scarf. With the birth of my first child, I wondered if hope would stay with me like that birthmark on my left hip. Or would I live somewhere between stepping back from sputtering bacon grease and the first step of the cliff diver? Hope lives, but requires agility. The soft spot on his tiny head frightened me so I stared for hours or pretended it wasn't there. The vulnerability was suffocating. Staring down into the crib, Matching our breaths, he showed me how to look for the light. Every day in his lunchbox, I sent a note so he knew I was there. Hope never left me after that. It tried to skitter away, but my children always found it in the yard and brought it back to me. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I almost feel like for people that live in the Pacific Northwest that a definition is needed of cloudburst to really understand this poem because although I've lived in the Northwest a long time, I grew up in Ohio where if you stepped outside in a thunderstorm after about a count to 10, you were wet, like really wet. And um, that's what cloudburst means in this poem. And I think 33 months and 13 months, uh, probably no one needs the explanation that that means a lot of diapers all at the same time. 33 months and 13 months. You are summer storms passing, days hitting my dust and big starting to rain drops, 
the smell of just wet ground all around, anticipating the soaked through cloudburst nature of that which passes swift. My hands play pat a cake, small arms reaching for me. Mommy, mommy, eyes light and eyes dark, my two weather systems. Now is a wet time and I sling my hair, thankful in the thunder for the deep soaking rain. So I had two kids. They're grown now, but they weren't always grown. And there is something sensual, but more than that, to little kids and babies. And that's something that cannot be communicated, but it can't be forgotten either. So this is a celebration of that phase of babies. Your poem. Bodies, minnow bodies, necks, the smell of necks. Hair, the brush of feathers, round arms between thumb and palm. Balanced, you on my hip and my heart. What you said, your first song, how much you weighed at two, these I don't remember. But the feel of you, the you of you, I keep, where I keep what I will never forget. So uh, when my daughter was um, preschool and into early primary, when the moon was full and visible here in Oregon, which wasn't all that often, uh, we would climb up into the loft and we'd have we'd uh, have moon baths, and uh, and that memory lives in me still. Moon stories. When you were five, we took moon baths together every month, reclining in an open window, splashed by the fat full moon. Stories poured in from Africa or Ireland or your favorite, the one we made up about your ancestor, the Cherokee moon princess. And when the plot was thin, you thickened it. If the telling was slow, you told it at your own speed of life. Tonight I bathe alone, the milky glow from the full moon caressing the folds and bumps of this mother body, white light beaming all the way through this busy brain, erasing the future as it comes and goes. And I don't know much, but this, you and I are free, each of us, you to sing your moon stories to the world and me to listen to what the moonlight reveals. Uh, moon stories woven between parents and children. What magic moments. I loved making up stories for my children. It was like they, they freed me to be creative. Time before bed was special and often poignant. The time when they would ask questions that couldn't be asked any other time. Mm -hmm. Seven-year-old worries. Lying on the floor in the quiet before bed, she asks, will I die? Yes. Will you die? Yes. Her eyes fill with tears. Not for a long time, I tell her. That night she dreams of pearls. The pearls, she whispered, the pearls that grandma gave you. People were coming to steal them and I went and got them and hid them in the back of the toilet. I saved them. You have 
saved me, I answered. And, and speaking of children saving us, um, which, is a, which is a wonderful and beautiful thought that I can totally relate to, there's also a very humorous side to being a mother. And for some reason, the idea of assault and battery came into my head as I was thinking about being a mother. And, and this is what came out. So it's not assault and battery, it's assault and batter E. Wishing I could bake, I try to bunt. Peering through the oven window, I see only the sagging bumpy lump. My kids will have store-bought again. There's a, uh, you probably have done this. You look at photos of people that you knew after they were grown and you see pictures of them when they were really little. And you go, oh my God, they looked like that from the time they were six months old. They haven't changed a bit, but you can't tell it from the other end. It's a mystery, but this is about looking at old photos and seeing your children. Ephemera. In this old photo, firelit faces, Wizard babies practicing magic spells, wands made of marshmallow sticks, making signs, red lines. What were they writing? Hers curving skyward, his escaping the frame, foreshadowing in burning branches, sparks in the dark. Well, here we're going to do a little fast forward to the teenage, the teenage years. And um, this is a poem that I wrote on the first trip I took alone with our oldest child. And during that trip, they had their very first uh, experience driving the car. First time driving. We are far down the road in the desert. I am backing a rental car down perilous narrow tracks, avoiding deep ruts, wishing for a farm truck or a horse or better sense. My teen asks, why don't I use the rear view mirror or the backup camera? Why am I twisted and sweating, looking over my shoulder, straining for gas and brake pedals while we back down what I shouldn't have driven up? I say, this is how I learned to back. Finally, we back past the tumble down corral and I can finally turn the car around. We hit the main road, eventually finding a docile dirt road in its accompanying Wild West corral, just as the man had described it to be. And I stop just to admire that we have found it. We are still in the middle of nowhere in the desert, but now on the road to our trail. My teen asks suddenly, can I drive? And I take a good look around and then I say, sure. And they drive smiling, eager, but wiping sweaty hands on jeans every so often. Uh, yeah, so um, now there's more sweatiness. Um, If, if you have been one of those parents who took your child to college or summer camp or, or something like that, you might be able to relate to this. The college drop-off. I say, what will contain my days? We feel blankly at each other. My garden still blooms. I think it should stop. 
for a few days at least. As I look in the rear view mirror, I see each frame of him waving goodbye. I'm not losing a son. I'm groping for a new life. Um, I probably am not going to be the first one to say this, but kids grow up too fast. <laughs> there are moments when this does not feel true, but on the whole, I think, yes, it's, it's true. This one, especially poignant for mothers, daughters, daughters growing up is called X-rated. My daughter texts, she needs some things she left behind in her dresser when she left for school. She needs her sports bra and some undies and posters for her wall. I take the list to her empty room. Sports bra, check. One of mine she needed in a rush a couple of years ago already. Undies. I pull out these butterflies, these posies, these secrets that Victoria whispered into a flicking ear. Striped sailors, polka dots, gold lame, leopard spots, black lace, cotton nylon, a thong. I never gave her those. All I ever gave her was the second X. So I seal them up in a leftover bubble mailer and put her East Coast address in two places just to make sure she gets what she needs. But she should buy new posters. She's outgrown these. Uh, how they grow up and become themselves. I might not have chosen the ways they chose, but it turns out it was just right for them to become holy themselves. Still, some things scared the living daylights out of me. This poem was written after my son and his girlfriend, now his wife, were arrested in the Miami protests, 2000. On hearing that my son is in jail for a protest. Did they hit him? Will they hit him? Are they harder on boys? My boy, my son. If we were in Argentina or Guatemala, I might never see him again. And I would walk with his picture down the street, begging for his body. Am I safe from that? The mother of the Haitian guy in New York rushed out when he opened the door and the police felled him full of bullets. She wasn't safe. Police have the right to hurt, the right to kill. They raise their guns for protection, for correction, for execution. The state has the right to take our sons away. I lie on my soft bed, trying to imagine him there. Does he have a blanket? Seems like, um... I've been interested for a really long time in the differences in our child and my child's different fate and paths and their difference from me. Um, and uh, when I, they were babies, they were both very blonde and fair. And I was, I'm dark and I was tan a lot. And I would have people ask if they were adopted. So I started telling them that um, actually I'd had an affair with a polar bear. Um, and this is kind of a reflection on that with, uh, with my daughter. That night, the last golden girl. That night, the tiny spark that you became hit your father's eye and ricocheted into my womb. And I dreamed of a swarthy girl child, a round, dark little me. But when you struggled your way out of the dark of this body and into an uncertain dawn, you were bald, blue-eyed, pink. Then you grew into a long, lean Nordic beauty, a lingering whisper from your Aryan past, 
a woman forever blessed and cursed by a few insistent recessive genes. That poem is a testament to how mothers get what they least expect and love it anyway, or because. In this poem, I try to capture the strength and ferocity of mother love, a beast all of its own. Mother love, untamed creature that boils the heart's blood, pushes against ventricle walls, swells capillaries to hardly breath. Mother love, escaped, surging out to engulf the birth of us, the life of us, the death of us, so torrential, it could crush the fragile beings it made. So ordinary, so everywhere, we lock it safely away to save the young. I love that last line. That poem was new to join the collection. I really, really enjoyed it, Nancy. So this uh, poem is a, a story that's been passed on from mother to daughter to mother to daughter in my family for maybe 150 years. Dreaming daughters. The women in my family dream up their daughters. And so I dreamed you, a strong baby woman, just as my mother dreamed herself a sister instead of a baby. And her mother dreamed a prodigy, Shirley Temple of Saline County. And her mother before her dreamed up a milliner. But the mother before that, a new immigrant turned into a widow by yellow fever, that mother just dreamed of getting her daughter's bellies fed. And so she let them go by boat to an orphanage, signs dangling from necks in the only language she knew, saying, keep them safe and I will come. And when she couldn't, when she didn't, couldn't, an orphan train took them who had, uh, to new farm families with mothers who at least spoke the old tongue, who adopted them and who fed them and who put them to work cooking for farm hands until they began to have dreams in this strange new language. And when their German blood mother traveled hundreds of miles to find them and they were safe, happy, fed, she built a little house the size of her new dream down the road from their full bellied lives but she just kept on dreaming and watching in that new place because that's what mothers do sometimes. Mothers across the ages dreaming and watching. As I age, I still find myself dreaming, watching, listening for my children's songs. Bamboo flute. Even after all these years of your absence, I am hollow like a bamboo flute, vibrating with your long notes, your breathless syncopations, resonating with notes of me in you, you in me. Echoes fill the hollows that held you. Of the poems I've written, I think this one uh, perhaps catches best what I wanted it to catch. When you were children. I wish I could tell you just how you were, singing to yourselves, tying stuffed animals to furniture, bathing and instructing naked dolls in the bucket, shaving off your eyebrows, and how we loved your running through the summer, swinging on the tire swing, asking for popsicles, scepters fashioned from elderberry branches, children flashing bright as birds. You'd say, how about you're the mommy kitty and I'm the baby kitty? If you could only see your tough little bodies, faces fierce with blackberries, legs scratched and bruised, games filled with movement, the migrating mounds of grass and flowers arranged for nests and graves, and your voices, 
If only we could always hear your voices layered one over the other, rising and falling with the day, the high, sweet, infinite sound of you. Hmm. Okay, well, I hope we took you on a journey. I know we enjoyed it and went on a journey as we were writing them and sharing them. So thank you, Courtney. Yeah, that that was beautiful, all of you. That those were such beautiful poems. Um, all right, uh, we don't have a whole bunch of questions, but that's okay because I wrote some that I would like to ask you as well. Um, and I would love to hear from all of you if we have time. Um, my first question is, what poets inspired you to decide to write your own poetry? So whoever wants to start. Any of you can answer first. <laughs> well, I was, um, I was a professor of anthropology and I had to be fairly rational all the time. And I needed to not be rational sometimes. And I think uh, poetry was my time for that. And I have so appreciated being in a group like this that uh, we can share both our poetry and our deep feelings with each other. I was going to say Lawrence Ferlinghetti. When I was 16, there was this Coney Island of the Mind uh, book on my speech teacher's shelf that I stole. <laughs> I remember, um, I, in fact, I just took it out. I, I've moved a lot of times, but for some reason I still have this book. It's called um, Poems Every Child Should Know. It's from 1904. It's got black uh, electrical tape along the spine and the pages are starting to um, disintegrate. But um, I remember for some reason, I don't know how I got the book, but I remember memorizing poems out of that book like Little Orphan Annie and um, Robert Louis Stevenson's um, My Shadow and, and things like that. So I may be a reluctant poet, but I think the seeds were planted very early. Cindy Smith, do you wanna give an answer? Um, I would say I like many poets, um, but uh, Adrian Rich was a, especially an inspiration. And I would say both of our kids are named after poets, uh, one after Adrian Rich and the other after Walt Whitman. I love that, that's so fun. Um, okay, we do have a question from Alexandra um, and they ask, can you talk about the role of nostalgia in your poetry? So I think that's for all of you. Go ahead, Cindy McCain. Yeah, I, um, I'm looking forward to Jana Zwiebelman reading her poem because although many times when you're, when you're looking backwards, um, you want to remember the good times, not all of mother's poetry is about the good times. I wanna be clear about this. We all have the other poems. We just didn't share them tonight, just in case you wanted to know, um, but, when you're looking back, it's so easy to remember the good times. And nobody wants to remember the diapers anyway. Seriously, really, so. Anybody else wanna talk about the nostalgia in their poetry? Well, I, I think um, when, I, when I had my first child, it was a very long labor. And then I remembered suddenly talking about having another child and part of my brain went, what is wrong with you? Don't you remember what you went through? And the other part of my brain said, no, I don't remember that at all. I just remember holding that little baby and it was so cute and so fun. And so th there's that kind of nostalgia, which is I think biological almost. Um, and then there's a, the, another part that is emotional of sort of holding on if you will, ho holding on to this, to the babyhood of that. And I know some people that have a lot of children 
And they, I, when, when asked why they have so many children, they say, because I love babies. I don't like them as much when they grow up, but I like babies a lot and I just want to keep having them. So I think there's that other kind of emotional part of, of having them that, that, that it is held in those places, if that makes sense. I think uh, it's interesting that the uh, the three poets that we invite, of the three that we invited, two of them had poems called Bad Mother. So we'll get an antidote. <laughs> Anyone else? We, we also have more questions if you want to move on. Okay. Um, the next question is also from Alexandra, and they are asking, I'm curious if you had shared your poems of motherhood with your kids, and if so, what was their response? <laughs> Which I think is a great question. I have had my daughter in the room listening to me. <laughs> so, but I hadn't shared before that. She liked them. <laughs> she was grateful. I, I have to say that having your mother write about your underwear, it's incredibly embarrassing. Um, and then for the parts that are tender, no, it's still incredibly embarrassing. What can you say? Yeah, I, I have one scientist and one, I, I would call her an artist. And the artist doesn't want to hear it, neither does the scientist. So they're, they're like, you write poetry, mom? Good, good for you. Good, good. You, they kind of pat me on the head, so. My daughter really appreciated the one about the family, matrilineal, the lineage of the family, when I read that to her. Cindy Smith? I would say I have uh, my oldest child loves poems as a poet themselves, always wants to read poems. And my youngest child has no interest at all, I think. All right, awesome. I love those answers. Um, I have one more question that I want to ask, and then we will move on to your special guests that we're really excited for. Um, my last question is, what has being a part of this group helped you in forming your poetry and the way that you write? And what is your favorite part of being a part of your poetry group? I would say deadlines and um, companionship. I think a key part is trust. Um, Deb has a poem about how writing a poem is kind of like, it's a baby almost. And to have a group of friends who can hear poems from their very first outing and then gently help you shape it into something a little bit more graceful, you have to have trust. And I think that it really works out for us. I would second the uh, trust word. Uh, it's a trust uh, in putting your poem out there and receiving gentle criticism and suggestions, which are so valuable, but also a trust in putting your life out there for people to see. And, uh, and I feel good doing that in this group. I think I'm a, a newcomer compared to others. I'm not sure in the entire group, but um, I, um, I, I was very tender at first and I didn't, wasn't very trusting, but then I, these, these must be some awesome mothers because uh, the trust came. They, they hold your heart tenderly. I'm the newcomer to the group, and um, I, I thought it was very brave of them to invite me. Um, because when you have a, a group that's uh, got legs, if you will, um, you're now introducing this 
this sort of stranger into the room and oh what's it going to be like and what's she going to say and uh, and and that's a real thing i mean the the chemistry is is uh very important to uh my productivity in in terms of writing poetry i would say certainly if if i were just hacking around all the time with poems then it may not be that important but you know to be held in that kind of esteem so quickly was really a blessing and a great gift to me. Awesome. Well, I think we'll leave the last little bit for your special guests, but thank you for answering those questions. And I think it's very uh, poignant that the language you all used also had to do with kind of mothering and what you've been talking about to talk about each other. So, all right, with that, I will let you introduce your special guests. I, I would like to introduce Jenna. Jenna, turn, turn your camera on. There you are. So Jenna Zwiebelman is the poet laureate of her own backyard and is also a visual artist on the loose now in Bend, Oregon, although she used to live in Corvallis. She's collaborated with creatives of various persuasions from a painter to a flugelhornist. Her work appears in quality journals and anthologies such as Calix. She was a featured poet and on the presenting board here in Corvallis for The Magic Barrel. The poem she'll share today, The Bad Mothers, is also available as one of her chapbooks. And it was also premiered as a short stage play in Central Oregon several years ago, as did her piece, Kitty Sews Corsets for Courtesans. Jenna. Thank you. Um, are we gonna do visuals? Uh, I'm back. I'm back. So not being able to share screen, sorry. <laughs> okay, tell me, if is this gonna work? No? If Courtney can can make me host again, then I can share my screen because I have it all queued up, but. Okay, let's just... well, while we're trying that, I wanna show you that this is a breakthrough. Are we waiting? Courtney? Yeah, you should still be able to, I did not stop. I did not take host away from you. Well, all it says is that same screen. You can't modify who can share. Okay. Um, I'll work on it behind the screens, but I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to. So I'm still a host. I'm still the host. Yeah, you are the host. It demoted me to a panelist. <laughs> um. Okay. I'm not sure what to do. Uh. Okay. Here, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Perfect. Okay. Okay, speaking of technical difficulties, a lens keeps dropping out of my glasses. <laughs> um, I think I won't introduce it except to say, this is called The Bad Mothers. My kids will never forgive me for this poem. And I say to them, but you're not the intended audience. Of course you don't get it. So I hope there's some mothers out there with grown kids who will get it. Oop, scrolling through. And I illustrated this. Back in the woods, the bad mothers gather, growl, guffaw the call to congratulate themselves on their bad, bad jobs. Monstrously thin or huge, lovely, each runs away to this nasty crowd alone from all directions, gotten out of their children's hair at last. They've come a long way, maybe, just to pat themselves on their backs with their terrible soft hands and celebrate. The fear mothers have made, me have made ready, scrubbing and spreading their fears around, trembling the ground. Close behind them is heard. I think you want to go up. Close behind them is heard closer, closer. The world whimpering wail. Whoa, the worry mothers. Oy, they chant, Vez mir, how I failed. You failed, they failed, we. The list is long. They toll the bells. What went wrong and what is wrong and what can go wrong tears till the martyr mother mourns who cares i care no one cares oh how the sighing mothers sweetly sigh now as the daughters and sons go down the rally cry no one could have mothered worse they laugh they're done their dances begin 
Some mothers tiptoe around everything, some stomp on it all. Others push in where they don't belong, whooping and hollering. For spoiling appetizers, the bites their children's heads off mothers clamp on and sink their teeth in deep. They huddle to grumble of chewing up children, but the bad taste is left in their mouths. They spit it out and for just one more story time, gnash the old wives tale of horror. Brats bite back. A feast is brought on by the smothering mothers, more casseroles they baked offspring into. They pour thick sauce over recipes for disaster. Lady bad mothers thank themselves graciously. They serve, serve, serving so rich. Oh, my sweet lard. Set on the table right in your face. The gravy spilleth over. The children inside the dishes can't breathe. The lean and hungry bad mothers snatch food away while the bad milk and cookie mothers put the icing on the cake. Eat, they say, now to each other, passing the guilt. Eat it anyway. Eat, darlings. Yes, the bad mothers alone together recognize the endless rituals. Come on, they shout, it's our turn. They start some games playing favorites and kick back and toss and turn and hide yourself. The scores lose, lose. Then they get ready for nag time by the talks their heads off mothers. Just because they told you so a thousand times with a billion different words in their sharp mother tongues, be careful, be good and can't, don't and do it now, but no one's listening. While the mothers who never said a word about it stand off and the two busy mothers busy themselves, busy hands, busy bodies, and the big hippo critical mothers mutter, what bad mothers. Here at dusk, even long gone mothers and absentee mothers dare to show their faces. It's past time for makeup. The babysitter's fashion show shows them all up. This is the mothering vogue. This is how to. They recite in horrible unison the experts' words. Never pick up the little crier. Always pick up the little crier. Every bad mother oohs, coos, applauds. The bad mothers who gave up everything. The bad mothers who gave up nothing. The bad mothers who gave up. And those who didn't, did not, never will. The bad mothers clap at the glossy display. This season features the freshest to young mothers who knew no better and the latest to old mothers who just can't understand. The commentator never fails to mention that whatever each did in any color was terribly, fashionably too tight, too loose, too long, too short, unfit. Stumped behind each tree and under every rocking chair are more bad mothers, the discount mothers and just as stage mothers and the wire monkey surrogate mothers providing milk, but no fur. Bad mothers, bad, bad mothers, now in the endless parade, lugging on their backs the mother load, circling, waving, handmade banners, Manufactured threats, things hidden behind curtains and faces, waves of remorse and waving grains of truth, tossing it all to the extreme right and leftovers mothers. Da-da, they hear the echo of the child's first word, the child who always knew which parent was good. Da-da, the coronation of the worst mother in the world. Every one of the bad mothers grabs her crown accepting her scepter, each lovingly dangerous. Bad mother bear protecting the idol, raising high a barefoot and pregnant. Don't tell her what she's in for. Queen bad mother, it's mother's night. Now they take back, unwrap their own gifts and so finely. The bad mothers light the ceremonial fire under all. The old snapshots of the same old children still pointing Freud's fingers. The bad mothers smell smoke dancing around the blames, celebrating, ha, ha, somewhere in the woods, we bad mothers go on late, late into ourselves at last. That was great. <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah. Great. I'm, lov I'm loving all your, all of your sentiments in your poems. Well, that was a pretty cool sentiment too. <laughs> <laughs> Celebrating. It's good to see you, Jana. Um, mm -hmm. So this, I want to talk about Stacy Smith because she has a poem. I don't know if she's reading it about bad mothers. So that was quite ironic when we started talking about this. Um, Stacy is. Um, uh, um, so Stacy is um, working on her sixth book of poetry with Shanti Arts, uh, and uh, basically, uh, I just wish. I mean, she could be in this group. We all could. She's got uh, her con contact with the moment and with nature is so powerful, um, and. She is a fourth generation Oregonian and she has three sons and, and she's a grandmother of three, two girls and a boy and another gender unknown. And uh, number six will, uh, all right, this next generation will, will be sixth generation Oregonians. And uh, originally Stacy now lives in Eugene and her family I think uh, was very, was in Philomath uh, earlier before her, before she, they moved to Eugene. Stacy? Oh, you'll need to, yeah, there you are. Hi. Hello. Okay. Hey. So, Jonna, you're not the only bad mother. I wrote a poem, Bad Mother, and I'll share it if that's okay. Don't want to bum people out. But I wrote this when my second son was an infant and um, and it almost didn't survive. Uh, I mean, the poem, not the infant, because I didn't want my sons to ever read the hard part of mothering. And so this is like a confessional. And so I, I wonder if any of you mothers can relate to this. Um, bad mother. I am not meant for mothering. These hungry mouths, these yearning little hands the eyes that look to me for comfort must find me cold as steel. I do not nurture well. The sweetness of my baby's soul at times provokes my cruelty. If I were a wilder beast, I would have left my offspring long ago, like Ursidae, like leopard mothers do like all the other beasts who know no torment of the mind. So one more, uh, coming down the stairs, I wrote when my, all three sons were with me. And um, one thing that mothering has done for me is heightened my sense of my own mortality and the mortality of everybody else. And um, many times I'm sure all of you as mothers have consoled your waking babies. And in this case, I kind of consoled myself with um, they're there, it's going to be all right. Death is um, okay. Coming down the stairs. Coming down the stairs at night, I think maybe this is how dying will be going one step at a time into darkness. There may be no 10 sure paces across the darkened floor, nothing memorized or known. There may be no child crying from a dream, needing me, my hands, my voice, myself. Even the mind's eye conjuring all of this may be blind. Coming down the stairs at night, I think each step is a pearl. Days and nights, one after another, some kind of string binding them. A necklace with my dying its clasp. 
And just one quick little last one um, from a grandmother's perspective. My first grandchild, um, uh, a boy named Ari. Grandmother's song for Ari. Crickets sing as I hold you, behold you, perfect newborn wonder. The night song, the daylight, our names becoming smoke from sweet incense. Who made this? The fragrant wind, the wide sky, the mystery that brought you here. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you all you wonderful poets. My gosh, it just blew me away, all of you. Made me cry. Thank you, Stacy. Me too, I've been pinching my fingers so I don't cry. <laughs> I didn't even bother. <laughs> cry, and cry. I can't wait for you all to meet Julia now. Uh, and I, I'm not sure everybody uh, knows Julia. Um, Julia Fahrenbach is gonna come on the screen. And uh, she's a mom. She has two teenage girls. She's a life coach, an artist, a poet, and an author of one book of poetry. She's most at peace when walking with the trees and the quiet in the forest where she draws her inspiration. Uh, her poems are in a, a Liberated Mind by Stephen Hayes, a, a, an anthology called Poetry of Presence. Um, Live Love Now uh, by Rachel Stafford. And she's often on Huffington Post and several online pl platforms. And then I had the uh, wonderful surprise. I was listening to a Tara Brock meditation maybe about a month ago. And at the very end um, at the meditation, she uh, gave the name of this poem. I don't know whether you're reading it tonight, Julia. And, and said, this is by Julia Fahrenbach. So, so I was like delighted. And I, are you gonna read that tonight, Julia? I wasn't planning on reading that one tonight. <laughs> well, we can, we can uh, have, I don't know, contribute to the suspense. The name is A Cure for It All. So y'all might wanna see it. <laughs> Hi, Julia, thanks for coming. Thank you so much, Susan Grace and, and Grassroots. And thank you for inviting me to be here. I, the first poem, this is an interesting thing because it's a brand new one and I have never had such a hard time finding a, a title for a poem ever. I usually just, they come and this one isn't so much coming. So for now, the name of it is The Most Important Thing, part two, and we'll see, it could change. Okay. And this, this really, for me, is a message that I would like to just whisper in my daughter's ears. Um, it's more of what I most wish for them. Please, my God, please do not hold any of it back. Why would you? It's like trying to hold back the ocean with the tip of your little finger. This life, this force, this happy explosion that is you. Come a little closer. Let wave after wave tumble. Let gust after gust blow you entirely to the ground. Don't be afraid. You are the ocean, deep, wild, fierce, infinitely bendable, blessed beyond compare, a thread of intricate, intricately woven, impeccably designed you-ness. Not a thing can break you here in your sweet hallelujah depths, not a single thing. Let the hand that is whole reach for the one that is broken. Stand up now, spit out the mountain, throw open your full moon wings. Hmm. 
And I know we're kind of late here. Um, I do have another one, but I can, if we're, if we're rushed for time, we're a little after eight here. So I can go either way on that. I said, go for it. Okay. It'll be right. conclusion. Okay, well, and here we go. Okay, so this next one is called the most important thing. <laughs> and this is really more about mothering self. Um, about that little person that maybe we re re uh, resisted our whole lives, like I, or not our whole lives, but a good part of the life where I just didn't quite want all of it. And now I feel like I'm learning to, to maybe even embrace is what I'm thinking here. <laughs> okay. I am making a home inside myself, a shelter of kindness where everything is forgiven everything allowed, a quiet patch of sunlight to stretch out without hurry, where all that has been banished and buried is welcomed, spoken, listened to, released. A fiercely friendly place I can claim as my very own. I am throwing arms open to the whole of myself, especially the fearful, falling apart, fault-finding, unfinished parts. Knowing every seed and weed, every drop of rain has made the soil richer. I will light a candle, pour a hot cup of tea, gather around the warmth of my own blazing fire. I will howl if I want to. Knowing this flame can burn through any perceived problem, any prescribed perfectionism, any lying limitation, every heavy thing. I am making a home inside myself where grace blooms in grand and glorious abundance, a shelter of kindness that grows all the truest things. I whisper, hallelujah to the friendly sky. Watch now as I burst into blossom. Thank you. And thanks so much everyone for being here tonight. Thank you for bringing us back to ourselves. It's yeah. an excellent, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Thank you. And for Stacy and for Jana. Thank and for you. Courtney. Thank you, Courtney. <laughs> yeah, thank you all. This was a lovely event. I know we ran over, but thank you for everyone for staying, for those beautiful poems from everyone. I want to thank you on behalf of Grassroots, of uh, Sandy and Jack, the owners of the bookstore, for having this beautiful event with us, um, and for all of you for sharing your poems. Um, stop by Grassroots if you're in town. We are open again, and we would love to see all of you. Um, with that, uh, thank you. <laughs> Have a good Thanks, night. Courtney. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs>